so thank you for the kind uh, invitation. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here. Uh, today's session uh, will focus on bacteriophages, uh, uh, both myself and the next speaker, Dr. Vlasdel. Uh, we'll talk about phages as a source of new antibacterial design strategies. And uh, that's uh, part of the research that uh, we are doing in, in the lab of gene technology. We're focusing on fundamental molecular microbiological research to inspire new biotech and antimicrobial uh, technologies. And for this, we are relying on uh, bacteriophages uh, or bacterial viruses. Uh, so not all viruses are bad uh, in that sense. And uh, these bacteriophages were actually discovered uh, just over a hundred years ago by uh, Frederick Twartz and uh, Felix Derrell. Uh, Felix Derrell gave the name uh, bacteriophage or bacteria eater uh, from uh, Greek. And uh, what they observed was actually on a lawn of bacteria, uh, negative colonies, zones in which uh, bacteria could not grow and were actually being lysed. And uh, it was proposed that these were uh, viruses, and there was a lot of uh, debate about that, but finally, uh, this was uh, proven. So viruses very specifically infecting uh, certain bacteria. And uh, under the electron microscope, this is a nice uh, image of uh, one of the largest uh, bacteriophages that is found called Fika Z, in infecting the uh, bacteria Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And you see its uh, proteinaceous structure uh, consist where each of these little lobes uh, constitutes individual proteins that almost magically uh, assemble into this superstructure uh, that is in fact a, a major capsid. And I will start the laser pointer. Uh, the major capsid proteins uh, and uh, additional protein that form the uh, capsid that holds the genetic material of the phage. Uh, most phages have a tail. In this case, this is a contractile tail that's going to act as a sort of syringe that's going to inject uh, the genetic material of the phage uh, inside. And uh, yeah, this structure uh, in the capsid for, for this large phage even uh, has a histone-like structure on which the DNA is spooled and uh, the uh, sheet uh, is contractible here and is going to uh, allow the injection uh, of uh, the genetic material. So uh, when we look at uh, a, lytic, a strictly lytic bacteriophage, which I will focus on today, uh, what do we have? Uh, we have here, it's not fully drawn to scale. Here you see it more nicely. Uh, we have in fact the bacteriophage that in a very first step is going to recognize very specifically uh, a certain receptor on the bacterial cell wall and is going to uh, land uh, on that surface. And this interaction is super, super specific. So uh, you have phages specific to a certain bacterium like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, like Staphylococcus aureus. And you will see that even only a subset uh, within that species is being targeted and, and recognized. And the biomolecules that are being recognized here uh, can be the LPS layer, can be specific proteins, outer membrane proteins that are present or pili that are involved in uh, motility. So, and that's a really important concept because it shows how specific these bacteriophages are and how through evolution, uh, they have uh, adapted uh, and co-evolved with the bacterial host to be uh, this specific. So uh, after this, uh, the DNA of the phage is uh, injected and actually the first of the proteins encoded by the phage genomes are being expressed. And this is something, and I'll, uh, another thing that is really remarkable, uh, within a couple of minutes, these small phage proteins have very specific targets uh, within the bacterial metabolism, and they are going to convert 
this bacterial cell and its metabolism towards uh, virus production, towards the phage uh, metabolism, so to speak. So after this, uh, the viral DNA is replicated. In some cases, the host DNA is even uh, degraded and, and or uh, and, and that involves a real reallocation of uh, nucleotides and, and how the synthesis of the viral DNA uh, is working. In the next step, uh, there is the assembly of the new uh, phage particles. Literally, as I showed you previously, thousands of proteins coming together in a structured way to form the virion particles. And in a final step, there will be enzymes called cell wall hydrolases or lysins uh, that are going to degrade the cell wall and uh, the progeny phages will then be released to the environment and we have this uh, lysis of the uh, bacterial cell. What's truly remarkable is that this whole process is happening within a matter of minutes to hours. And what you see here is a one-step growth curve for three phages, FICAZ, LKD16, LKA1. The names are not important, but you see that if one phage particle infects for this phage, LKD16, within 27 minutes, the lysis occurs and there is 120 progeny phages uh, emerging. So you have this self amplifying effect uh, that's really important uh, for phage therapy as uh, the next speaker will uh, surely highlight. So you start from one phage and you end up with several tens or hundreds of phages after this uh, infection cycle uh, between half an hour and a few hours very much depending on the phage. So those are all, let's say, uh, a little uh, microbiology uh, background into that uh, infection process. But uh, in fact, when we look at this uh, infection cycle, uh, we can derive at various stages, uh, different mechanisms on how we learn from bacteriophages, how they are inhibiting and destroying the bacterial cell. And by studying this, we're trying to develop new antibacterial design strategies uh, that we can utilize and find new ways uh, to complement antibiotics uh, to kill uh, dangerous uh, pathogens. And there are three main strategies. Uh, a third strategy is the actual use of the phages themselves in, in phage therapy, uh, which will be the topic and the expertise uh, also of uh, the, the next speaker, so phage therapy. I will speak about two aspects. On one hand, small molecules inspired by phage and phage enzymes that act as antimicrobials. And for that first part, these small molecules inspired by phage, we're actually looking at the early stages of infection. As I mentioned before, within a matter of minutes, these small phage proteins are going to hijack the bacterial metabolism, meaning that there are phage proteins that are interacting with bacterial proteins, in our case, mostly uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and that hijacking mechanism, we want to know. Uh, you have to realize the, the interaction between phages and bacteria has been going on for billions of years, this co-evolution and gradual steps and development. The phage through this co-evolution has learned exactly what processes to target and how to target them more efficiently. And knowing uh, how, the, how uh, these host uh, proteins and key complexes of the bacterial metabolisms are targeted is very important uh, for uh, drug discovery. And these phage proteins, if you want to apply them from the outside, they're of course too big, but I hope you can imagine that if we uh, learn how a phage protein inhibits a bacterial protein, we may develop a small protein that's going to mimic the action. And that small molecule is something that can be added as an antibiotic 
going through the cell wall, uh, going through the cell wall, and then targets this evolutionary optimized um, uh, target. And uh, through our fundamental research, uh, we've learned that uh, by studying uh, phage proteins, these phages are basically targeting all aspects of the bacterial metabolism. We have phage proteins that are inhibiting the replication process. There are phage pro proteins that are inhibiting transcription, translation, RNA stability, cell division, the metabolism and signaling, the motility of the cell. So for each of those key metabolisms of the bacterial cell, there are already phage proteins that in their own specific way are uh, targeting those um, uh, key complexes. And today I'm going to focus just as an example on one of these uh, small peptide called Iggy. So the Iggy peptide. And, and in fact, uh, how it works is that all of these small proteins, and this is a linear representation of the bacteriophage genome, uh, where you see individual uh, phage orbs. And the interesting part is that when you have the lytic infection cycle, this is always, almost always reflected in the genome organization of the phage. So you have a number of proteins that are presumably involved in host takeover. You have a number of identifiable proteins that are involved in uh, genome replication, like DNA ligase, DNA polymerase. And then you have a huge set of proteins that will be part of forming the uh, phage particles and a number of proteins involved in host lysis. Uh, and, and all of that is contained within in the genome. So in order to identify interesting new phage proteins that are targeting the uh, host metabolism, we have to go looking inside of the genes that are expressed immediately after uh, infection. And those early genes, you can take an individual coding sequence and actually place this in a uh, plasmid vector under the control of an inducible promoter, and then transfer this to the Pseudomonas aeruginosa cell. So that's very different. Eh? So before we were talking about the phage infection process, here we are taking a bacteria and we are literally loading it with a single gene from the phage expressing this and then trying to see is the expression of this one phage gene inhibiting the bacterial metabolism in a specific way. I hope I'm not going too fast. Everything is clear so far. Uh, secondly, uh, what can we learn from this? So we have a number of uh, controls. Yeah? What This is a uh, single cell uh, expressing just a phage ORF. And, and if no, no ORF is expressed, this uh, single cell will grow into this uh, micro colony. But if we uh, introduce a gene that is toxic for the cell, that is, in other words, uh, targeting a key metabolism of the bacterial cell, yeah, this will cause growth retardation, like in these cases, or in case of our Iggy peptide is causing the cells to grow as a filament and then lice. I hope you see that these cells are not looking healthy at all and they're actually getting lysed. So the introduction of that gene and the subsequent expression is causing this enormous uh, imbalance uh, where DNA replication is inhibited uh, and which is causing these uh, long stretched out uh, cells. So what we wanted to do next, obviously we know that this phage protein is doing something toxic to the cell, but we want to know very specifically what in the bacterial cell is actually being targeted. Yeah? And uh, for this, we use uh, molecular techniques 
and uh, we took the phage protein and see if it was sticking to other uh, proteins. And a technique used for that is a pull down experiment where our phage protein uh, here marked on this SDS page gel uh, at, at this height uh, is, is going to pull out and specifically bind in this case to gyrase B protein encoded by uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This was then further uh, zoomed in to see what the actual interaction site is using a technique called uh, bacterial two hybrids. I, I will not go in, into technical details, but it really shows the specific location at which this gyrase B protein is uh, being targeted. So when we saw this interaction between the phage protein and the DNA gyrase complex, we were actually very happy uh, because the DNA gyrase complex is very important for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And it consists of the gyrase A subunit, the gyrase B subunit, and DNA that passes through and, and interacts. So the gyrase complex in general grabs DNA, is going to introduce some uh, breaks and realign it and rejoin it to uh, have supercoiling of uh, the DNA. And this is an essential uh, process in uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Yeah. Moreover, uh, among the known antibiotic classes that are being used to treat uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa infections, are the fluoroquinolones like uh, ciprofloxacine, which is illustrated here. And this antibiotic is at this, this uh, chemical molecule is actually interacting with the gyrase A. So interestingly, this is already a target that's being exploited in uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and uh, of high value and uh, usability. So here on our side, we have our phage protein that's interacting with gyrase B yeah, and interacting this key target, uh, the, G, the gyrase complex, uh, which is an important antibacterial target. Yeah. But we wanted to make sure, does the phage protein actually inhibit the function of the gyrase complex? Yeah. <clears throat> And again, as a reminder, when uh, DNA is added to, to a DNA gyrase complex, it will supercoil the DNA. If you uh, imagine, a, a, for example, a plasmid uh, a, as a rubber band, if you uh, roll it up really tight, it becomes supercoiled. And, and when you put this on uh, an SDS page, DNA, and you add gyrase to it, the gyrates will induce the supercoiling and your DNA molecule will migrate through the gel uh, much more uh, rapidly. Yeah. Uh, if you, and this is an in vitro assay, and you add some gyrase to the DNA under the correct buffer conditions, you get this supercoiling. If you add ciprofloxacine, the more ciprofloxacine you add, the supercoiling event is uh, gone. And in fact, we saw when we expressed our Iggy peptide that also the supercoiling uh, was no longer present. So that sort of confirms that our phage protein is binding to gyrase B and is inhibiting in vitro the function of the uh, DNA gyrase. As I mentioned, uh, fluoroquinolones are an important antibiotic. But uh, as you know, and with emerging antibiotic resistance, there are also already pseudomonas strains that have become resistant to fluoroquinolones. And those pseudomonas have specific mutations in the gyrase A that rendered them uh, insusceptible or reduce susceptibility to this antibiotic. So we were wondering, if those problematic strains, are they still being killed by when the Iggy peptide is uh, present? And indeed, we had four such mutants, which had specific mutations, uh, for example, here 
uh, the 83rd amino acid mutated from threonine to isoleucine. Uh, and that gives them complete resistance to ciprofloxacin. However, when we expressed our phage protein inside these strains, they all died. And, and that sort of proves when we go back to the complex that the phage protein is interacting in a different way with the DNA gyrase compared to the antibiotic, make it, making it uh, more valuable. And, and hopefully in the next step, we will go into the chemistry and uh, instead of creating this, uh, in having this entire protein, we will go to a small molecule that uh, mirrors the action of the uh, phage protein. So in general, uh, study for us, studying these unknown genes and uh, these early expressed proteins that are also called the viral dark matter, they help us to understand phage biology, but also the bacterial metabolism. And those phage proteins can serve as, as an inspiration for phage-driven target discovery. So again, to summarize, uh, we, from the biology side, we have our host protein interacting with the phage protein. This identification and selecting the useful ones, if in the next step, we create small molecules that have an antibacterial effect that can work. And in fact, this has been done in the past for Staph aureus, where a certain gene product binds uh, to another uh, DNA synthesis protein uh, was actually mimicked by a small antibiotic that could be added to cells and uh, elicit the antibacterial effect. So this is the first way uh, in which phages can serve and as, as an inspiration uh, to find new uh, antibacterial uh, strategies. Uh, the second that I want to focus on is the use of phage encoded enzymes as uh, antimicrobials. And for this, we're looking at the very end of the infection cycle, uh, where we have our newly formed phage particles, and we then have the cell wall, uh, which is a barrier that the progeny phage need to overcome in order to be uh, released. Sorry, I'm going to close the window. Um, a barrier that needs to be overcome so that the progeny phage can be released. Uh, in gram-negative bacteria, this is the cytoplasmic membrane, the peptidoglycan layer, and the outer membrane. In gram-positive bacteria, it's the membrane and a very thick peptidoglycan layer uh, that will be present. So again, what's happening in biology uh, there's enzymes being made that are going to disrupt and destroy this peptidoglycan layer from the inside out. Yeah. And those are the enzymes uh, that I want to focus on today, the enzymes that are breaking down this peptidoglycan layer, which is basically the major structural determinant of the bacterial cell wall. And of course, uh, when we talk about gram-positive bacteria, we want to use recombinant proteins, enzymes that are applied, applied from the outside that are in a similar fashion going to degrade the uh, cell wall. And that's uh, the basic concept here. So in effect, functioning very differently from uh, normal antibiotics, uh, these enzyme-based antibiotics. So in fact, uh, a little biochemistry, how is this working? This uh, peptidoglycan layer uh, is in fact a uh, structure uh, consisting of an acetyl glucosamine and an acetyl muraminic acid that are alternating chains. Uh, and two chains are connected by a bipeptide bond. And this will form the peptidoglycan mesh that uh, will define the shape of uh, any bacterium, basically. Yeah. So the phage in its arsenal has these different enzymes to degrade the peptidoglycan bond, 
bond. The, those can be uh, amidases, those can be muraminidases, breaking down those chains or breaking down the peptide bonds and therefore weakening and releasing uh, this peptidoglycan structure. So again, here, we're stepping away from the phage, which has to overcome this barrier twice, once to inject its DNA inside the cell, and especially at the end, to release the, the progeny phages. We're stepping away from phages, and instead, we're going to use the enzymes themselves. So we're going to produce these enzymes in Escherichia coli or another uh, yeast host in a recombinant way, and then apply these uh, enzymes from the outside. And this is uh, work almost 20 years old from uh, Martin Luster's group in uh, Switzerland, where you can see if you re uh, apply this recombinant uh, enzymes, these peptidoglycan hydrolases to gram positive cells, the um, uh, peptidoglycan is degraded. And in fact, within a matter of minutes, uh, you have full lysis of uh, the bacteria that are uh, present. And this concept was developed further in various preclinical trials and currently in, in clinical trials. And one of the set or two of the seminal pieces uh, of research that I will show you are, are also 20 years ago, where the lysin of a streptococcus phage was taken uh, to target uh, streptococci infection, so uh, topical infection. And uh, this lysin was acting very specifically towards those group A streptococci, leaving other commensal uh, microflora unaffected. And uh, what they did was they uh, took 21 mice, applied uh, 250 units uh, before they were given an infectious dose of uh, streptococci. And when they did that, uh, they saw that uh, the infection rate dropped uh, more than double, uh, indicating that the lysins were offering a good protection from colonization by uh, streptococci. Also, uh, what they did was first infect uh, mice with a lethal dose of uh, streptococci. And after this, uh, they applied uh, lysine. Yeah? And they saw that uh, uh, this uh, streptococci were no longer present after uh, two hours. And if they gave doses uh, repeatedly, uh, periodically, uh, they achieved a curative effect. Another example uh, of gram-positive bacteria is uh, Bacillus anthracis, which you may know uh, if you inhale them as a powder, those spores. Those spores will be phagocytized uh, within the lungs, and more specifically in the alveolar uh, macrophages. They will uh, desporulate, uh, migrate to the lymph nodes, and then emerge and start amplifying uh, within the bloodstream, and that can obviously lead to septicemia and toxemia. Uh, and when they provided a lethal dose of bacillus anthracis to 19 mice, and subsequently provided uh, another lysine that's specifically targeting uh, bacillus anthracis, they saw an increased survival rate of uh, 68 and 77 uh, percent, depending on the dose of the recombinant enzyme uh, given. So those are two key examples that show that uh, these uh, endolysins can be given to uh, apply from the outside to uh, gram-positive pathogens. And it's illustrated here, gram positives have a plasma membrane and a thick peptidoglycan layer that's exposed to the environment. So applying from the outside these enzymes, it makes sense uh, that they are functional and uh, will uh, destroy the bacterial cell wall. But a number of bacteria, when we think about Klebsiella, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Acinetobacter maumani, all members of the escape pathogens uh, that are so critical uh, and for which new antibacterials are needed, 
those are gram-negative bacteria. So they have the plasma membrane, they have a thin and conserved peptidoglycan layer, but they also have this outer membrane and LPS layer. So if we were to apply endolysins from the outside, yeah, they would not work because they would not have access to their substrate, the peptidoglycan layer. So in order to overcome this, uh, it's important to understand what's happening in this outer membrane and how it's actually stabilized. And, and it's in fact due to two major forces. On one hand, uh, there are calcium and magnesium ions that are going to uh, shape the cell wall with uh, ionic interactions between the phosphate groups. And that's going to stabilize that outer membrane. And secondly, in bacteria like E. coli and Salmonella, uh, it's the hydrophobic stacking of the fatty acid chains uh, that are going to uh, give a rigidity and stability to that uh, outer membrane. So those are two basic forces that we can hopefully overcome. And uh, what we were able to do in our lab is to engineer endolysis and add to them uh, outer membrane permeabilizing peptides, a peptide that's either going to interfere with these ionic interactions or peptides that are going to interfere with this hydrophobic stacking, causing a destabilization of the outer membrane and subsequently giving access to the peptidoglycan to the endolysin moiety. So we're truly aiming for a local distortion of the outer membrane and uptake of the endolysin, which then is followed by uh, killing by degradation of the peptidoglycan layer. And this was indeed uh, working depending on the specific outer membrane peptide that was fused. And we could get log five reductions against Pseudomonas aeruginosa or associated to the monastrin putida or burkolderia, log five reductions. And when we use these engineered uh, uh, license, yeah, drastically increasing the antibacterial effect of uh, wild type license that had only one log reduction, maybe two log reductions. So, and with some specificity in this case, based on whether uh, the a peptide was targeting the ionic interactions, uh, whereas in E. coli, it's primarily the hydrophobic stacking. Yeah. But very importantly, one strain that we tested uh, was the uh, BR667 strain, which is basically almost all omni resistant to all known antibiotics, was still being killed equally well compared to other Pseudomonas strains. And that's because these enzymes are ob obviously uh, functioning in a way that's completely different from uh, traditional antibiotics. They're also acting fast in a matter of uh, five minutes, 99.9% uh, .9 of, of bacteria were uh, killed. And another thing that's really important is that there was a very limited uh, resistance development against these uh, engineered endolysis. If you were to add ciprofloxacin to Pseudomonas uh, at uh, sub-inhibitory uh, conditions and, and you were to passage them and wean them to increasing amounts of antibiotic, you would see that after 10 cycles of, of growing uh, these bacteria, they would a, have a 64-fold increase in the uh, amount of antibiotic needed. And that was not the case uh, for our uh, artelysids. Uh, the mode of action, I, I think, is clear. The, the cell wall is actually uh, being degraded, causing the cytoplasmic matter to bulge, matter to bulge out and then, and then destroying uh, the bacterial cell. Um, also, yeah, that, that mode of action and showing that mode of action is important. It was also important to show that there is limited resistance development. And uh, finally, also another aspect that's important is persistence. I don't know if you heard about this, but 
In any case, antibiotic resistance, if you have a culture of bacteria and one bacterial cell is resistant to a certain antibiotic, when you apply this antibiotic, this will be the only cell that's surviving. And if you allow them to regrowth, you will have a population that's fully resistant uh, against that initial antibiotic. Persistence is different. Eh? You can have a group of cells and maybe some of these cells are not metabolically active. When you apply an antibiotic, you will kill the majority of cells. But when you stop the antibiotic treatment, you again have a regrowth, but a regrowth of a bacterial population that's actually still sensitive to the antibiotic. <clears throat> so these persistent are dormant variants that escape uh, antibiotic treatments uh, and are tolerant in that sense, but will then uh, cause uh, new problems in, in chronic infections. And we wanted to see our, our engineered license. Uh, if you do an antibiotic treatment and you're left with persisters, are these going to be also licensed um, by uh, the RT license? Because they're operating in different way. They're not relying on metabolic activity of, of the cell. Uh, it's more like rusting of a bike. Yeah? It's, it's degrading the cell wall. And we indeed see when we apply uh, 10 times the MIC, uh, we have some additional killing of persister cells. And if we apply some trace amounts of EDTA, which is often present in ointments, we can completely eradicate also these um, uh, persister cells fully. Yeah. Um, this was further confirmed in in, in vitro uh, assays where we were growing keratinocytes to confluency. Uh, and after we have growth here of those keratinocytes, we were adding uh, the bacterial load. And after one hour, adding our peptidoglycan engineered protein, and then testing after four hours if bacteria and keratinocytes were uh, still present. And this application, we saw that indeed the bacterial counts drop quickly. Uh, if the cells are infected, we see the survival of the keratinocytes that we're trying to protect decreasing rapidly. And indeed, the RT license were able to partially and fully uh, restore or protect the keratinocytes uh, present. So, in conclusion, uh, we this um, Enzybiotics are uh, interesting. They are uh, highly active and now operational against gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, uh, acting uh, relatively specifically, and, and that's uh, very important. Uh, that's being used in, in various models, uh, not only for medical, but also veterinary and other uh, applications. Uh, they're very safe. And uh, there are actually for gram-positive bacteria, the, uh, some phase two clinical trials currently uh, ongoing uh, for uh, endocarditis uh, uh, and bloodstream uh, infections. All right, that's uh, the main message that I wanted to relay. Uh, if you're interested in, in uh, phages and more, there is an online three-week course that you can uh, follow. Uh, it's open, it's free of charge. It actually has uh, videos, transcripts in English, Polish, French uh, that you can follow and that goes from the basic virology of phages, phages as antibacterials, but also phages as uh, biotechnological tools. Of, of, if you have questions, you can always uh, contact me by email. And uh, if you're really interested in phages and, and phage research, we have a conference upcoming next week in Portugal, but this is fully booked. But next year, there will be in Georgia, Tbilisi, a conference on virus of microbes where you can uh, learn more. That's it from my side. I'm uh, ready to take questions uh, and uh, discuss further. 
Thank you very much for your report. It was very interesting. And I think that this course will be useful, not only for us, uh, but also if we share with our students, it's also will be very interesting and very useful for learning. And uh, please, oh, I have one question. May I ask you? Uh, you said about the um, different types of pathogen, but as I understand, it uh, they are um, they are extracellular pathogens, and that's why these phages can influence on their growth and development. But maybe you know, or maybe you work. What about the intracellular uh, pathogens? Are yes. there any? Yes, this is a very interesting question. Uh, when we talk about mycobacterium uh, and, and uh, pathogens in general that are hiding on, on the inside, uh, then it becomes problematic, especially for these uh, molecular techniques. And this is something that uh, needs to be taken into account, uh, enzyme engineering to allow them to go intracellular. Small molecules, those are chemical properties and I think also my colleague uh, Bob Lasdell, in terms of phage therapy, uh, there are some options available uh, to uh, make them act on, on these intracellular pathogens. If we think about listeria, for example, um, but there it's mainly avoiding contaminations. But for mycobacterium, there have been a number of cases where phage therapy has applied. Uh, on the enzymes-based approaches and small molecule approaches, I don't think there are any examples. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, we have uh, some questions from our participants. I will read uh, from Mikhail Ivanov. What applications do phages have in agricultural sphere and are they safe? It mm -hmm. is the first question. Yes, uh, so phages in agriculture are certainly a point. Uh, within Europe, uh, there is uh, in the Netherlands a company uh, for which has uh, phages against listeria in food products. Uh, there is also in the UK a company uh, which adds phages as a food packaging aid to prevent bacterial rot in uh, uh, bacteria caused by uh, uh, specific pathogens there. Uh, the major concern there is uh, the method of application. Are we really going to spray entire fields with phages or can we be very smart and pinpoint at what location? Uh, and this can be the seeds, this can be uh, in, in, at specific places in greenhouses. Can we have targeted interventions with phages that will reduce uh, that availability. And, and I think those are options uh, that are there uh, in agriculture. And the same is actually true in, in farm animals where also there have been uh, some examples as well. Okay. I actually see the next question from uh, Yula. Uh, is that... Yula Ishenka, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can bacteria evolve mechanisms to circumvent phages to become resistant? <laughs> Another very good uh, question here, uh, and the Red Queen certainly applies. Uh, there is a co-evolution of resistance development, but then in turn, because the phages uh, are um, uh, also adapting, that you have this uh, uh, conti or, or continuous um, warfare, let's say, in which there is resistance and counter resistance mechanisms uh, that are uh, evolving. Yeah. Uh, and one more question from yeah. how long this research was conducted and how long antibiotics is created usual. What I want also to ask you about the period of creation, these mm -hmm. uh, medicines or antibiotics, is it balance or what Yeah, is yeah. It, it always takes a long time and, and uh, you have to uh, 
make make a distinction between uh, scientific research and then commercial development and approval uh, that can take many years, right? Uh, I think uh, and the license have been described for, for 20 years uh, and we're now seeing clinical phase two trials. So a window of 10 to 15 years is certainly not unusual. Uh, this is the same for antibiotics. This is the same for um, uh, the en enzymes. Uh, for phages uh, that my colleague will discuss, uh, my former collaborator, I should say, uh, will discuss in the, in the next uh, lecture. Okay, I think that it is uh, the question about the uh, bacterial resistance and effect of antibiotics, of enzymes, of phage, and this, it is uh, who is more quickly. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. So I, I will talk about the target discovery. Uh, so those small molecules would basically be antibiotics and you can expect resistance to occur. Uh, however, uh, you have to be mindful that through billions of years of coevolution, the phage has chosen that specific site as the most efficient one. So we're hoping that if we inspire small molecules to target that site, it will be less prone to resistance, but in theory, it's an antibiotic and would have a similar uh, window of, of resistance development, uh, but that's a reality. Yeah? Uh, with the enzymes, yeah, that needs to be carefully addressed. We see very little to no uh, resistance development uh, using the endolysins. And I think it's because it's targeting such an essential uh, aspect uh, of cell wall integrity. Okay, one more question. What do you think about the wastewater treatment from antibiotic resistance bacteria using bacteriophages? Uh, very interesting uh, to, to try. And, and there are some projects uh, running on this currently to, to study this. Um, uh, it's important from a One Health perspective, but the same care needs to be given here. Are you going to apply in large quantities bacteriophages to the environment and what will be the impact of that? We don't expect off-target effects, but in terms of resistance development, those are still questions that are open. Okay, and one more. Do you consider the antibacterial activity between your product and classic uh, decontamination liquids like Mm -hmm. 7% are ethanol or isopropanol yeah. and etc. I, 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 I want to make a clear distinction between uh, decontaminants and uh, the uh, approaches I've outlined before. Decontaminants are not, uh, unless you're Donald Trump, uh, are not for uh, ingesting or uh, medical use, let's say. Uh, but the biggest distinction I would, they, they, they can work well in terms of decontamination, but they have no specificity. Uh, I think any sustainable alternative to antibiotics is going to be much more specific than these compounds or broad spectrum antibiotics. I think the future will be much more targeted, will be much more mindful of the commensal flora and the good flora that has to be retained that would also be removed when you're using uh, decontamination liquids uh, and so forth. And I think with less uh, side effects in this case. Hopefully, yes, yes, yes. That's the assumption and, and a more rapid treatment that if the, if the good flora can take over more quickly because it's not being targeted, this will happen much more rapidly and will hopefully uh, if we're talking about gastrointestinal cause, much less gastrointestinal uh, distress and, and so forth. Okay, one more question. Is it safe to use such therapy for human bacterial disorder treatment? What uh, so if we're talking about infections, the infectious diseases in humans, uh, I think uh, yes. Um, these viruses, you have to realize, are targeting bacteria. Bacteria are prokaryotes. When we compare to the coronavirus, to name one, or influenza virus, they're very much tailored towards 
uh, bacteria which have no nucleus and, and all of the promoters, all of the regulatory elements. So the chance that this phage will jump from a bacterial host to a human host is, is extremely, extremely remote, I would say. Uh, and yeah, so far with phage treatments happening in Eastern Europe and also in Belgium, uh, uh, there have been uh, no side effects reported uh, to date. Okay, and one more question. What are you planning to research except phages in the future? Um, I, I will stick to phages. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, let's say <coughs> um, that's the focus of my research group. Uh, I've outlined today uh, many of the antibacterial potential of phages, uh, but when you consider CRISPR, when you consider uh, the pet expression system, there's also a lot of uh, biotechnology and synthetic biology applications that can be inspired by phages, and, and that's another aspect we'll be focusing on much more in the future. And the last question, it is, about, it is from me. Uh, can you uh, answer, is this picture near you? It is yes. your picture created by you? Yes, I'm surrounded by phages. So uh, I, I've had the luck that one of my PhD students, her husband is a graphic artist. And he's from Poland, uh, Mikołaj Wodacik. And he uh, drew these, um, phages and uh, designed the other pictures here as well. <laughs> it is emblems of your group, maybe, or, or your research. Exactly, exactly, yes. Okay, thank Page you Page diversity. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for your uh, report and thank you for your uh, answer. It was great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.